so grateful to have the opportunity to stand before you again this week. Grateful that we have uh, an evangelistic focus in our congregation and have uh, made it possible for our regular pulpit minister to be out and doing God's work in a foreign land and certainly hope that they have safe travels. Grateful for those who are with us visiting this week and pray that you will have safe travels as well. As was mentioned earlier, it is a holiday weekend, so uh, a lot of times on holidays we just trade people out for a little while and everybody goes back. Uh, but we are so thankful for those who are here and uh, this opportunity to worship and study this morning. If you will, uh, you will see the key text for our lesson today will be John chapter 17. Momentarily, we are going to begin in John chapter 16. We will spend most of our time in those two chapters uh, with some uh, other commentary from areas of God's Word as well along the way, but that will be uh, kind of home. You probably won't even need to use your, uh, your, your bookmark. Um, before we begin, let me say that uh, I am so grateful uh, on behalf of myself and of Brian, who both serve, both of us serve on the board of directors for Camp Negehi for your response to our recent appeal for the Heart of the Matter campaign. We had a, a very good response to that and more funds uh, coming in uh, even this week. It's not too late if you would like to take the opportunity to contribute to that work. We had a meeting Thursday evening the preparation for this week, this year of camp is underway. We will have uh, lots of opportunities uh, and work days. The congregation can help and chip in, and we would certainly uh, covet your prayers and uh, invite your help in those efforts. With well, Sojourners, a great group of Christians, will be back out at the camp for a time during the spring to help us get ready, and we are certainly looking forward to our year of camp. Uh, so thank you for your response to, uh, again, to the appeal for funds to help that ministry. Jesus' prayer, John 17. This is an important part of the scripture. All scripture is very important. This is a key text in the Bible, especially when we're understanding the mission of Jesus and the man, uh, Jesus, and Jesus as a deity. And this is a, an important part of scripture and in seeing uh, what it was that was on the mind of, of Christ before uh, he became the sacrifice for all of our sins. It's been suggested that this is Jesus' high priestly prayer. We know in the Old Testament under the, the law that was given uh, through Moses that there was a system of uh, atonement for the sins of man and that there was a high priest that came once a year on the Day of Atonement and went before God in the, the, holy, uh, the most holy place in the tabernacle, and he mediated uh, on behalf of uh, himself and the people. He had to prepare himself to do that, to make sure that he was approach, be able to approach God, uh, and then he would intercede on behalf of the, the people of God and we see that this is the process that is taking place. If you, if you think about the prayer that Jesus offers at the time he offered it, this is uh, very synonymous or, or very similar to what was going on on the Day of Atonement. We know the book of Hebrews speaks of extensively about Jesus being the perfect high priest. Uh, perfect in that he was perfect, was sinless, and that also, th th this would not need to be done every year. Jesus would offer himself once for all and then become forevermore uh, the perfect mediator between God and man. This prayer takes place on the, the, just right before Jesus is going to offer himself up as the sacrifice for all of our sins. Uh, respected commentator G. Campbell Morgan said about the prayer of Jesus in John 17, he said, I would ever be careful lest I should appear to differentiate between the value of one part of the Holy Scripture and another. But no one will deny that when we come to this chapter, John 17, we are at the center of all the sanctities. So this is a very important part of Scripture, important in understanding Again, Jesus and his ministry and his mission. But before we go into the actual text, 
of that, we would want to kind of set up what's going on here, and we'll do that from the preceding chapter, chapter 16. In John chapter 16, beginning in verse 16, Jesus says, A little while, and you will not see me, here talking to his disciples. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us, A little while you will see me, and a little while, uh, again, a little while you will, uh, you will, excuse me, a little while you will not see me, and again, a little while you will see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he says, A little while? We do, know not, we do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew they desired to ask him, and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. So Jesus, of course, is talking about the fact that he has been there laboring with them in his ministry, and they have become obviously very close, working together for God, with Jesus, and he says to them, you know, in a, in a little while, I'm going to be gone. He's, he's, he is helping them understand, uh, as he has figuratively in many ways told them already, I am, going, I am going to be offered up and hung on a cross and die and be buried in the ground. He's preparing them for this. But he also says, a little while you will see me. He will be resurrected, be raised from the dead, and walk among them again for a time, because he says, then I will go to the Father. So, obviously, this is going to be difficult for the disciples of Jesus to bear when he, is, when he dies on a cross and is buried in the ground in a tomb. But he says, that sorrow will turn to joy, of course, because of his resurrection. And then they will understand more about this when he returns to them and then goes to the Father. He equates this in verse 21 uh, to a woman and, and childbirth. He says, A woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. Your heart will rejoice, and your joy uh, no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most surely I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, you'll receive that your joy may be full. So Jesus is, is, is helping them understand what's about to happen. And he says it's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. Like it is difficult when, a, when a, a baby is born. But the joy that comes from that overshadows uh, the difficulty. So uh, he is preparing his disciples for what's going to happen. And then... In verses 25 to 28, Jesus goes on to say, These things I have spoken to you fig in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that you, sh uh, excuse me, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So the time is coming. At first he, he tells them this is going to happen in a little while. Now he tells them that the time is coming. And there's been this figurative language. We have several examples of figurative language in the Bible with regard to Jesus and his mission. Uh, he talks about uh, the temple being destroyed and rebuilt in three days. Uh, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, living water, that if a man drinks it, he will never thirst. All these are figures of actual truths of God. Uh, and Jesus is now saying, you are going to see all of this come to fruition. It's going to be real. Uh, there's not going to be a figure anymore. Uh, he's mentally preparing them for the fact that he is going to be uh, hanging on a cross and that his life will be lost. So, in a little while, and now he says the time is coming, and then in the next part of the end of this chapter, he says the hour is coming and now has come. So in John 16, beginning in verse 31, he says, Do you, uh, do you now believe 
Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So, mentally preparing his, his uh, followers, his disciples, if you will, uh, for what's going to happen. Now he's eats them into this idea through uh, the words of Jesus that we read here uh, and, and tells them about the fact that they're going to be scattered. Their life as they have known it for some time is going to change, uh, but it's going to be okay that they can have peace because he has overcome the world. They will, you know, it's not going to be easy, and he's very, very honest with them. They will have tribulation in the world, but that's not the priority. The priority is the fact that Jesus has overcome the world. So it's going to be difficult, but it will be worth it. So this is Jesus setting the scene. Uh, after he tells this to his disciples, uh, he begins this prayer in chapter 17. And the whole chapter, other than just the first uh, part of the first verse, is the words of Jesus praying to his father. And in that prayer, he, he, he has three main uh, things that he prays for. First of all, he prays for himself. Secondly, he prays for his disciples, the ones that are there with him at the time, many of whom will become apostles. And then he prays for us. Uh, which is, is very interesting. So let's look at this important prayer, of the true prayer of Jesus. We call the Lord's Prayer, and we should call it the Lord's Prayer because Jesus offered it, but he offered that prayer to teach his disciples how to pray. This is Jesus himself praying, and that is why it is so important. So let's look into this and, and look at what Jesus prays for in the prayer in John 17. As we said, first he prays for himself, and he begins that, uh, in 17, uh, verse 1, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you, has given, as you, have, as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So in this portion of the prayer in John 17, Jesus prays for himself, or prays about himself. And he says, first of all, that the time is here. There is no turning back from this. Jesus was sent to do a job if you will, on earth, and he has completed most of that that's going to take place. There is the one final act that is going to be very important, the last stage of Jesus' mission on earth, and it's going to be very difficult. The time has come, and he is going to meet the challenge. We know that very shortly after this, on his face in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus will pray uh, if there's another way to do this, God, let's do that, but not my will but thine. He never turns away from his willingness to obey uh, God and to fulfill the mission that he set out on. So a great lesson for us that when something has to be done, needs to be done, is the right thing to be done, even though it's difficult, we have to do it. But he says, glorify your son. And he, he, that takes place because of the humility of Jesus. Uh, the process here of overcoming death and returning to deity, but it's through the humility of Jesus Christ. Matthew 20, verse 26 says, But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And this is what Jesus, he is serving us at this very moment in his mind and preparing for the ultimate act of service. But we think about Jesus and his life on earth. It was not an easy one. He was by no means a wealthy person. Uh, he, he came to, to do what God would have him do, but he was rejected even by his own people, even by his own hometown. He was despised. And a lot of times when that, 
word is used in the Bible, despised, it's different connotation than we think of. We think of when we despise some, something, we hate it. He was hated by many, but the word despised in the Bible often has a connotation of just being ignored. And if you think about what it is to be ignored, to not be paid attention to, this was the Son of God on earth to save man from his own sins, and many just ignored that. So it was not an easy thing for him. He was humbled, uh, but through that humility would become exalted. Luke 14, verse 11 says, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's certainly true in the life of Jesus because he was willing to take on the form of a servant uh, and be humbled and now will be exalted back to uh, a place in heaven with God. That is spoken to in Philippians 2 verses 8 through 11 where it says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So this wonderful scripture explains to us that Jesus came down to earth and became a man, a humble servant, emptied himself of something in doing that, and the time came when because of his humility he would be exalted again and that is what Jesus is praying about here to glorify your son he further turns the prayer when he's talking about himself to us uh, and those who were following him at the time that through his glorification we might be able to know God we might be able to know God we would know God through Jesus God would require obedience. 1 John 2 verse 4 says, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So if we claim to know God, we will be obedient to him as well. The way God loves. In 1 John 4 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Even in this act that Jesus is about to undertake, we know that the, the love of God was, was present and the driving force behind that because he wanted us to have the opportunity to have eternal life and was willing to put him, himself and his son through this. The love of God is a powerful thing, and part of knowing him is that love as well. And then thirdly, to know God, We must be in Christ. This is uh, an important of uh, knowing God. Scripture reference here, 1 John 5, verse 11 says, And this is the testimony that God has given us. So we can know who God is, but Jesus praying here wanted us to know God. We need to understand what is uh, included in that. And then finally... He talks about finishing the work. I have finished the work, verse 4, which you have given me to do. And, and, and aren't we thankful that he did? And now on the cross, Jesus had a mission, and it was not an easy one. And he's about to take the last, last leg of that mission, uh, the most difficult part. And he says, I have finished this and will be back with you the way it was before the world was. John 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus said, this will come full circle. He's going to die on the cross. He's going to be buried in a tomb. He will be resurrected. He will ascend back up to his Father. Uh, he is projecting the prophetic finishing of this work that is undertaking. So Jesus prays about himself and for himself in, in this prayer. Uh, and, and we see uh, the fact that he is, though it's difficult, he's going to meet this mission head on. Secondly, 
Jesus prays for his disciples. So we see the process that is taking place here. Jesus came down to earth, son of God, had a mission. Part of that mission was to train folks that could take up the, the flag, so to speak, and carry it after he was gone. He would train them. He would have things that would help them, the word through the Holy Spirit, uh, miracles and other things that would help them carry this on after he was gone. But he's praying for those men who he has trained to lead the effort after he goes back to God the Father. And he prays for them here. We will not take the time to read all of these verses, but first of all, uh, Jesus prays uh, about his disciples, and we, 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 it would do us well to think about what makes the disciples special. If you look at verse 9, he says, I pray for them, the disciples. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So Jesus, in, in verse 9, makes it special to be a disciple. He says, in, in this instance, I am not praying for the world. I'm, pray, I'm praying specifically about those you have given me out of the world. The disciples, these men who followed him and ministered with him to the people, those who believed in him while he was there. So they are special, and what makes them special? Number one, that they have come out of the world. John 15, verse 19 says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So there's a difference between being a disciple of Jesus Christ and being in the world. And being a disciple makes you special in the eyes of Jesus and in the mind of God. Also in 1 John 2.15, the Bible reads, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we get to choose. We know that man cannot serve two masters. We can either be a disciple of Jesus Christ or we can be in the world, one or the other. That's what makes these disciples special and why Jesus was praying for them to be able to carry on the work after he was gone. Secondly, the thing that made them special is they received God's word. Verse 8 says, For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So Jesus these men. He taught them while they were together on earth and they received those words. We have uh, the opportunity every time we hear the message that God has for us from his word, whether or not we will receive it or whether we will reject it. We can choose to be good ground or we can choose to be in fertile ground. Matthew 13 23 says, but he who received the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. We all have different talents and different abilities, but the one thing that we all have in common is the choice to receive God's word or to reject God's word. It will manifest itself differently in different lives, but we all have in common the choice to receive it or not. And then finally, the thing that makes disciples special to God is their unity. Verse 11 says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, through your, uh, through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may, be, that they may be as one, as we are. Jesus was praying for his disciples, the men that would carry on his work, to be unified in their purpose. And this is an important aspect of what was important for the disciples and for us as well. Ephesians 4, 1 through 4 says, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, and through all, and in you all. So Jesus prays for unity among those disciples that would carry on his work. And finally, in doing all that, it will allow them to 
stay connected to Jesus, to reach others that are still in the world. They have come out of the world and they will reach back in and pull others out of the world to follow Christ and do this by preaching the gospel. He prays for them to be kept from the evil one, to be set apart from the world. And this reminded me uh, of a parent praying for a young person and for the, the stress that as parents we tend to go through and we see all of the things that are in the world out there that could derail uh, the, 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 the fruitful and, and pure life of a child uh, growing up in the world. And we pray that they be kept from those evil things and we pray that they will be sanctified, that they will be a, a, somebody that's set apart, that's holy, that's a Christian. And I see here Jesus praying for his disciples that they will be kept from the evil one that they will be sanctified by the truth that he has shared with them. All of these things uh, for a purpose. Jesus came with a mission. He trained these men to carry it on after he's gone. And then in the last part of Jesus' prayer, he prays for us. He prays for us, those who in the future would believe on him. And this is in the section of chapter 17 from verse 20 to 26, which reads, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me. I have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus prays for us. Now we know that in the Bible the, 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 the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Isn't it something to, to, to pause and think about that Jesus in his mind at this time, before he was about to go and offer himself on the cross, that he, he stopped to pray about that for himself and the, the, the thing that was going to take place. He prayed for those he let, would be leaving behind to do his work, and he prayed for us, even to this day, those who would, because of the work that they did, would come to know him and follow him. We, we are prayed for by Jesus here in the Bible. I think that's a wonderful thing to think about. First of all, he prays for us to be unified there in verse 21. Matthew 28, verse 19, we'll actually start in verse 16, the Great Commission. He says, then the 11 disciples, of course, not counting uh, Judas, went away to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here, in, in, with the idea of unity, what is it that unifies us in Jesus? It's the name, the authority, or the identity uh, to which we ascribe uh, as Christians and what we are baptized in the name of. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of that, it gives us the authority uh, to, to become a Christian and the identity of a Christian once we do that. This scripture talks about observing all things. This speaks to our purpose and to the instruction that is given to us. Observing all things. Going back to obedience that we talked about already. As a true disciple, we observe the things that Jesus has left for us. And then he gives this motivation I am with you, lo, I am with you, a promise and a motivating thought to know that we are not in this by ourselves. He told this to his disciples, told them to pass it along to us. We have the responsibility to know it, to live by it, and to pass it along to others. Jesus also prays for us to be with him where he is. In verse 24, it says, Father... I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me, with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. 
for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus wants us to go to heaven. He wants you and he wants me to go to heaven. I know that's a simple and obvious thing. If he didn't, he wouldn't have been willing to put himself through a a difficult life and death on the cross, separation from his father, taking on the sins of the world. In preparing his disciples in John 14, verses 1 through 4, Jesus said these words, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. Again, always coaching, always preparing. Jesus gave these wonderful words of comfort to his disciples that when the time came, but do we really think about the fact that he's prepared a place and receive us and take us there with him? Do, sometimes I think we don't live in view of the return of Christ. The book of Thessalonians talks a lot about this, and sometimes we, we run into those people who, who, who have an attitude that wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus would return right now? We're torn between, and Paul talked about the work of God and being with Christ. But he said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we really think about it logically, and we know what we, when we think about what we know about heaven, wouldn't it be wonderful for Jesus to return and for us to be in the presence of God and Christ in heaven? He's prepared a place for us, and he wants us to be there with him. And then finally, he prays for us to have the powerful love of God. Obviously, this is what it's all about. The fact that God loved us enough to send his son to die for our sins. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, in perhaps the most stressful time of his life, paused to offer a prayer. And he prayed for himself. He prayed for those that he had trained and would leave behind to preach the gospel, and he prayed for those folks that the gospel would reach. And this is an important, beautiful part of Scripture that we all need to be uh, mindful of. Circle that chapter number in your Bible as the true prayer of Jesus. In conclusion, we ask for prayers all the time, but Jesus prayed for us. Everything that could have been deemed as needed for Jesus' prayer to be answered in the affirmative has already happened. He has finished the work. He has completed the mission. The choice becomes ours as to whether our life will reflect a positive result of Jesus' prayer for us personally or a negative result. Would we, would we, would, would we let this prayer of Jesus go to waste? Or would we make the choices in our lives so that it will be fulfilled personally in our lives in the affirmative. Don't, don't let his prayer remain unfulfilled in your life. If you have need to respond to the gospel, even now, there's no better time, and you can do that as we stand and sing the song selected.